Good morning. Let's stand together as we sing 143. I stand amazed in the presence. 143 in your hymn books. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed on my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And we're going to sing the wonderful Jesus medley at 625 in your hymn books. We'll have the words for you on the overhead. Wonderful Jesus, let's sing together. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's word. Isn't Jesus, my Lord, wonderful? Wonderful, wonderful, Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise His name. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of Heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. I want to see my Savior's face. Heaven is a wonderful, heaven is a glorious, heaven is a wonderful place. But until then, my heart will go on seeing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on, until the day my eyes behold the city, until the day God calls me home, this world 
world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Of somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. More, more about Jesus. More, more about Jesus. More of his saving fullness. More his love who died for me. seated, <clears throat> invite you to turn to the book of Jonah. I, I have to tell you, when we sing that song, um, the part says, until then, until he calls me home, I want to always go into home, home on the range. <laughs> that's just, I don't know why, that's just, but what did they go? This world is not my home. That's probably a more fitting rendition than, than home, home on the range. Um, just, just so you know what's going on, this is the message now, okay? Um, I often uh, sit here and we sing the songs, and because I've been thinking on the message all week long, then I see in the songs how they're reiterating that. But then we sing the songs, and then you hear the message, and it's already gone, okay? So um, we will be doing a little more singing here that will reinforce what is in the message today. And uh, as you've been studying through the book of Jonah, um, this is a book that the average person is very, very familiar with, and of course, the average Christian. And um, as a result of that, sometimes familiarity makes us miss certain things. G. Campbell Morgan said, men have looked so hard at the great fish that they failed to see the great God. And what we want to look at this morning is where do we see God in the book of Jonah and what does it tell us about God and what is the application of that then in our own lives? Honestly, that should be our attitude anytime we go to the Word. What, what does this tell me about God? Because our purpose is to know Him and then to make him known. It's not just to go to the word to get principles for life. You can live life and not be in fellowship with God. And that defeats the purpose of living life. Our purpose is, as we said in the memory verse, whether we eat or drink to do all to the glory of God. And so we need to know God and to understand him. And right at the beginning of Jonah, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Number one, this tells us that God speaks to human beings. And God speaks to us throughout, throughout this book, chapter 2. And verse 10, so the Lord spoke to the fish. Okay, God is speaking. Chapter 3 and verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. We read in chapter 4 and verse 4, then the Lord said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? It is clearly understood that God speaks. God speaks through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. But God speaks to us through his word. The problem is not that God is not speaking. The problem is we're not listening. Now we need to be very, very careful. God ministers in our lives through his spirit. But 
boy, there have been many, many people that have gone into air because they said, God told me. Well, if it doesn't match up with the word of God, it wasn't God that told you. And that's why God speaks, and we ought to, we ought to forever thank God. God, thank you that you have spoken your word and that we have access to it. Thank you that, that we're not left in this life with no direction, no instruction, just to bumble our way through life. God has spoken by his word. And the word of God is, is given by inspiration. It's God-breathed. It, it's not just we, we say it's God's word. It, it really is God speaking to us. And, and it's easy for us to take this for granted, to just sit down and, and we sometimes take it for granted that we read it and then we bring it up for a vote whether we believe that or not. This is what God said. And, and we ought to every day say, God, thank you that you have spoken to us through your word. He spoke to us through sending his son. And, and it, it's, it's something that we need to value. I really believe that we as Christians don't value his word near like we should. If we did, we would have a hunger for it. We would have a thirst for it. We would, we would desire his word. So the first thing that we notice is that God speaks. And he speaks to us through his word. Secondly, you notice in verse 2... He said, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. We'll just stop there. God sees. All right? It isn't like God created the world and then just sit back. He's having a cup of tea, not paying attention what's going on. God noticed what was going on in Nineveh. He noticed the people. He saw the details of their lives. And and we need to understand God sees what's going on in the world today. More importantly, he sees what is going on in our lives. I can remember as a teenager reading Proverbs 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And and initially, that struck me from this perspective. Whoa, God sees every time I do something wrong, and that's true. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil. And later, I began to realize... He not only beholds the evil, he sees the good. That verse and the knowledge of God, the the fact that God sees, it's not like he doesn't know what's going on in the world. It's not like he doesn't see what's going on in your life. He sees it and he works accordingly and it said in In Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. Then God saw their works. After the Ninevites repented. God saw their works. So God is paying attention. He's not uh, an old man in heaven that that can't see and is looking out over here. What's going on down there? We sometimes think he's he's this... um, distantly removed being that started this and now it's all on its own. No, God is actively involved and he speaks and he sees and with his seeing, he thirdly, he knows. Notice verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. 
God knew all the details of where Jonah was going away from the presence and blessing of God. And, and he knew all the details of the sea, the vessels in the sea, the sailors on the ship that Jonah was on, all the, the fish in the sea. He knew all the details of all that, and, and he worked accordingly. God knows everything about me and everything about you, and yet he loves us unconditionally. See, you are the only one that knows certain things about you. And you don't even know all the things about you that God knows about you. And yet, God knows you and loves you. Someone said, we often think, and, and we know this isn't true in our mind as proper Christian thinking, but this is how often how we think. We think of God as he's too busy with the 8 billion people of the world. How could God make time for little me? I mean, little me, we're in flyover land, you know? We're in the flyover of the flyover land here in southern Iowa. Who am I? And, and, and those thoughts come to us. But God is not beyond time. He is eternal and infinite, which means he can be with every one of us Individually, every moment of every day. It's as if you were the only person in the world. That's how intimately God knows you. And, and he still wants to fellowship with you. He still wants you. Even, even as wicked as the Ninevites were. God knew every detail of their wickedness. But he pursued them. And you may think, nobody knows what's going on in my life for good or for evil. And nobody knows the burden that I'm bearing. Nobody knows. God knows. He knows every detail about it. And it's not just like, yeah, I know about that. He knows and he is intimately involved in our lives if, if we let him be. And even if we don't, he still is. But there's much more joy when we invite him in, when we yield to him, when we submit to him. So, God speaks, God sees, God knows, and then God controls all creation. Throughout the book of Jonah, a number of times it says, and God prepared. God prepared a storm. God prepared a fish. God prepared. Why? Because he's in control of all creation, and he can do whatever he wants with all of creation. See, the reality, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He is the creator, he is the owner, and he does with it whatever he wants. So, I mean, in his time, he controlled the great fish, come up and find this Jew, floating in the water. How did that happen? God did it. And it's easy for us to get living our life and taking life as a conveyor belt and think life is just life and God's not involved in it. God is involved in it. 
And we need to acknowledge that he, he controls all of creation and he works accordingly. Jonah knew it. Verse 9, Jonah, they said, who are you? Why is this happening? Who is the God you serve? Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. <laughs> Aren't we often like Jonah? I fear God, but I'm running from him in disobedience. I mean, we, we say the right things. Jonah was saying the right things. I fear God, but not enough to obey him. I fear God, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So to these sailors, they were thinking, whoa. Your God is the God of the sea and, and the waves are tossing and you better do something to calm this down with your God. Jonah said he didn't just make sea. He made heavens. He made land. He made it all. Jonah knew it. And like us, you know, we believe God created the heaven and the earth. We know it. But we don't act like it. We don't really believe, God, you are in control of every detail of life. And sometimes God steps into our lives and, and he shows us, wow, that was, that was a God thing. When, when we were in Switzerland, um, the hotel we were in provided breakfast every morning and we'd go down and there was a, a waitress there that reminded Marilyn and I of our granddaughter Dempsey. Didn't remind Denny of it, but any rate. And, and she spoke broken English, French, probably German. But anyway, we developed a sort of relationship with her and friendly seeing her every morning, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we'd, we'd found would be her last day. She didn't work Saturday. We would be there Saturday morning. And, and so we thought, we need to try to find a French track or something to be able to leave with her. Couldn't find one. Nobody had one that, that we were able to find. And, and so... <clears throat> We went on, thank God for Google, right? So we Googled YouTube French presentation of the gospel. And man, this popped up. Here's a French presentation of the gospel. Very brief. And, and so we wrote down on the, the address of that, the website of it. Wrote it down, and man, we're loaded for bear. We're going to breakfast Friday morning, and this is what we're going to do. And we go to breakfast, and she's not there. And it's like, man, bummer. You know, and, and we were. We were just bummed out about it. And we eat breakfast. We go get on the elevator to go up to our room to get our stuff for the day. And as we're going up to our room, the elevator opens on the other side, and the door opens, and there she stands, right there. And she's doing some housekeeping things, not a waitress. And, and it's like God said, here you are, you're bummed out, try this on for size. And, and so, you know... The, the door opens, and I immediately put my hand on the door because we don't want this shutting and going on. And we said, oh, we are sorry we didn't see you at breakfast. You don't work tomorrow, do you? No. And, and so we pull out the card and say, here's something we want you to look up and see. To me, I have no idea how that's going to end. I like to think we're going to see her in heaven, Okay. I don't know how it's going to end, but to me, it was like God said, I control all creation, and I can run the timing of this. I mean, you're talking seconds, the timing of this. And, and to me, it was like, 
God, you are a great God. And I stand in awe of you. It's not just once in our life God does that or every once in a while. God controls all of creation. And, and all of creation, so when that guy pulls out in front of you and uh, makes you slow down, God's even in control of all that. And we serve a great God that, that keeps this universe as great as it is, far beyond our comprehension, and yet he cares about every detail of your life and my life. That ought to encourage us. So God controls all creation. Number five, we learn from the book of Jonah that God rewards or blesses repentance. Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction and he answered me. And you've read chapter 2, Jonah's prayer. And then the Ninevites, when Jonah came and he preached, the people believed God. They, <clears throat> they proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth. And when the king saw this, then the king declared, everybody, we're going to we're going to turn from our wickedness and turn away from it. He proclaimed a fast, and the Ninevites truly repented. They brought forth fruits of repentance, the works that God saw. They brought that forth, and God blessed it. God changed his purpose in this, in this regard. It wasn't like he changed his mind. If they didn't repent in 40 days, judgment was coming. We'll see in just a little bit. God's purpose wasn't judgment. God's purpose was repentance. If they didn't repent, judgment was coming. They repented, and so God had mercy. And God always blesses repentance. The problem is... We don't repent very often. We don't change our attitude toward sin and our attitude toward God. And we do not turn from our ways to God's. Every one of us needs to become a good repenter. We need to, we need to teach our kids how to repent. We, we try to teach them how to get where they don't need repentance, and that's impossible because they're sinners. They're, they're, always, they're always going to end up doing something wrong. And even as believers, we need to learn how to repent. And, and this, is, this is so important, and I believe in our society today, we are in such a hurry and our, our, our spiritual walk is so rushed that, that we often don't take time to even think about our relationship with God, to think about our own personal sin to the point that we give the Spirit <clears throat> the opportunity and the invitation <clears throat> to convict us of sin so that we then can repent. <clears throat> it, is, it is of utmost importance that we come to God and ask Him to show us our sin. In, in thinking about this, I was reminded, and it's been, I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a number of years since we've had extended times alone with God, where <clears throat> we invite on, on one Sunday afternoon, we invite the men to come here and to go by themselves alone with God. And we provide a, a kind of a map how you can do that. And, and spend time alone with God 
two to three hours, and you might think, what would I do with that? Those of you that have done it and experienced it know what a blessing that is. And I've, we're going to be doing this November 13th for the men, okay? December will become the women. Because we need to wait before God and allow Him to deal in our lives. And, and always He'll show us an area I need to turn from that. And what our nation needs today is repentance. And God always honors repentance. When Jonah repented, God honored it. When the Ninevites repented, God honored it. And, and God will honor repentance in our lives individually, in our lives corporately. And that's how God works when we come back and align with his ways, he honors that. So we learn from Jonah that God rewards repentance. Number six, God gives redos and redos and redos. He doesn't just give a second chance. He gives much more than that. And... And I love how in the book of Jonah, it says, And the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Aren't you glad for the second times and the third times? I mean, God doesn't come to us once and then we don't obey and he just whacks us out of it. He comes, and he comes, and he comes. And I love, in Joel it said this, and now in Jonah, that the Ninevites said, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to repent. And I love this part. Who knows if the Lord will relent and turn away from his fierce wrath and leave a blessing behind. You know, honestly, I don't have much hope for our nation unless we repent. And I can repent individually. And who knows if the Lord will relent and leave a blessing behind because we serve a God that is a God of the second chance and the third chance and the thousandth chance. And every one of us today are a testimony of the mercies of God. Vody Bauckham said, Do you know it was his mercy that you woke up this morning? Because his judgment should have killed you last night. And that is the absolute truth. It is the mercy of God. Every day it's a testimony that God's given us a redo. Let's try this again. Let's get back up. Let, let's go. And, and it ought to fill our hearts with joy and thanksgiving. Number seven, God uses imperfect people. You know the story. Jonah went. He was a reluctant prophet. He reluctantly went. He went with a bad attitude. His attitude was, bring the lightning bolts, bring the judgment. And his heart wasn't right, but God used him. And Jonah is one of the all-time greatest revivalist in history. There was a great, great revival that took place through an imperfect vessel. Some of you think, well, God can't use me because of my past, or God can't use, I still don't have this all together. Nobody has it all together except Jesus Christ. And there is hope for all of us because God uses imperfect people. I've often said, if God didn't work in spite of us, he'd never do anything. 
He works despite our sometimes bad attitudes, despite our weaknesses, despite, and it, it ought to create a great um, encouragement and hope that, man, God can use even me. We also learn from the book of Jonah that God is no respecter of persons. One of the purposes of Jonah is to teach Israelites that God loves other nations too. He had to teach the same thing to Peter. Peter had to teach it to other Israelites that God loves the world. Paul had to remind Peter about it. But the reality is, God is no respecter of persons. Man, that, that, ought to, that ought to give hope to every one of us. I mean, I don't know many of us here that are up in the top 10% of anything we do. You know what I'm saying? But God is not a respecter of persons. Oh, you have this family name. Oh, you have this education. Oh, you have this money. No. He that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. If you have a broken and contrite spirit, God will not despise it. God is no respecter of persons. And number nine, God is more interested in salvation than condemnation. Jonah knew this. He said, I knew God that you are a gracious and merciful God, that you are slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm in Jonah 4.2. Do you understand? God is not a God that's walking around with a mallet like whack-a-mole and he's just looking for people to whack down. God is way more interested in mercy and salvation than he is in condemnation. And it's easy for us as Christians to get in the condemnation mode. God hates this and God hates that. and God, God hates sin, but he loves people. And the Ninevites are a supreme example of that. And God said, should it? Should I not have mercy on them? God loves people. So much so that he says, There is joy in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. I mean, the average person thinks the God of the Old Testament is a judgmental, angry God. That isn't what we read in the book of Jonah. He's full of mercy, gracious, and compassion. He's not willing that any should perish. God is more interested in mercy than judgment. And what this tells us, missions is at the very heart of God. The book of Jonah is a missions book more than anything else. And, and it tells us if, if people repent, God will minister and deliver. And God is much more interested in salvation than condemnation. And it's evident because he's long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish. That's why he hasn't come yet. He is longing for people to come to him. He's not eagerly waiting to bring condemnation and judgment. And then, lastly, God is to be feared. God is to be feared. When the sailors saw that when they did what they were told to do, the seas became calm. They feared the Lord exceedingly. Whoa. 
this is a God that has power over all creation. This is a God that has my destiny in his own hands. He, he is to be feared. So it's important for us to think, okay, this is the God of the book of Jonah, but it, it, it is also the God of the world that I live in. And I want you to look at those ten things, and, and I want you to pick one of those out that you're going to praise God for. You know, one of the things that, that our trip did for me, it helped me see, see things from a big perspective. And wow, God is over all this. It's easy to get focused. You know, it's easy to get focused. George Soros. Oh, what? That wicked man. Rah, 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 rah. God is over all that. I mean, he's the God of all creation. We, we flew over Greenland. I don't know how it ever got its name green because it's all white. But it, it, majestic. I mean, and it's like God says, I just throw this stuff out there like nothing. And, and you're fretting and worrying, seeing Rami in Syria living with joy because God is with him. And, and I thought, man, we're back in the States fretting and worrying about, oh, I'm not even going to all the things we worry about and fret about. And this guy's living in a war zone, and he's rejoicing in the Lord because the God of Jonah is real to him. And I want you to pick one of those, and in a little bit, we're going to go before God, and I want you to say, God, thank you that you know, that you know my situation. Thank you that you give redos. I... I blew it this last week. But you, you're a God of mercy. Thank you that you bless repentance. And you know, there's nothing that we can do more than to praise God for who he is. In a little bit, we're going to sing the song, How Great Thou Art. How great is he? He speaks to me. He sees me. He knows me. He's in control of all, cre all these things. That's how great he is, let alone the truths that are in that song. How God is challenging me. We need to get our focus on God, not on the great, great fish. Not on the storm. Not on the evil of the Ninevites. Jonah had it on, boy, they deserve the judgment of God. No, we need to get our focus on God and to get his heart and his purpose and see people how he sees people and to say, God, here am I. I don't want to be running away from your purpose and presence. I want to be running to your purpose and presence. We serve a great, great God. I mean, we sing the song, the little kid's song. Sing it with me, all right? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for you. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Think about this now. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do for you. Do we really believe that, though? I don't see how that person will ever get saved. Oh, my God is so small, so weak, and so insignificant, there's no sense of even asking him. We have not because we ask not. I mean, if, if God can turn the hearts of the Ninevites, 
Who is there that's too hard for God? And, and the thing, the situations you may be facing in your life, God is able, more than able that we can imagine. Lord, I pray that, that we would come running to you, your purpose, your power, your person. And Lord, that we would let nothing move us from you. Lord, forgive me and forgive us for not seeing you as a big God. And Lord, I pray that we really would come to see who you are and to see the application of it in every detail of our lives. So Lord, we rejoice in who you are May we turn from our ways to your ways, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen.